For over a decade, the Ace Combat fandom has had a vendetta against a game in the series. Even uttering its name opens up a flurry of controversy. I'm breaking the mold for this one. I know, I know. Oh, Falcon, you're a history channel, you don't review games. Baby, it's my show. Real talk, this game is a bit of an exception because I want to cover something that really hit me during my formative years. Ace Combat Assault Horizon is a 2011 game released for PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and later on, Steam, and honestly, I don't really see why it's so hated. I still keep talking, Colonel. Roger that. Well, okay, I see why it's hated, but I think it's time we took an honest look at it. Ace Combat Assault Horizon, or simply Horizon as I'll call it, has its roots all the way back not in 1995 when Ace Combat was released for PlayStation, but a humble 1992 arcade flight simulator known as Air Combat. Back in 1988, the Namco video game company implemented its System 21 graphics engine for arcade cabinets. Starting with the game Winning Run, the System 21, also known as Polygonizer, pioneered three-dimensional graphics rather than the oh-so-common sprites seen in most arcade games. Polygonizer games included Winning Run, Driver's Eyes, and Galaxian 3, among others. In 1992, Air Combat was released internationally in arcades. The game was simple. The player who flies an F-16 is tasked with defending his or her base from an incoming air raid. The game took a departure from other aviation arcade games by putting the player in the Viper's cockpit which depicted a realistic heads-up display. A targeting cursor would lash onto an enemy to depict a missile lock. From there, the player only had to... Did that fucking thing watch countermeasures? Yeah, for such a simple game, Namco really did put detail into how the AI enemies fought and defended themselves. They would jink and evade, and even launch chaff to confuse players' missiles. This is all back in the early 90s when most other flying games were, uh, non-existent really. Save, of course, for the fast-paced Sega Afterburner series. Sure, you had PC flight simulators, but this one was different. Anyone with a pocket full of change could sit down on the detailed ejection seat replica and become a fighter ace. Two years later, Namco released a sequel, Air Combat 22, which was named for the upgraded System 22. The game featured three aircraft to choose from and had a more Top Gun-inspired soundtrack. Fun fact, this was the first game in the series I ever played at our local arcade. I must have been like, what, five or so, which was 25 years ago? Oh my god. Let's shift over to home consoles for a bit. The brand new PlayStation had come onto the scene and Namco wanted to adapt Air Combat 22 to the console. Unfortunately, just porting the game wasn't as easy as they thought at first. Namco elected to develop an entirely new game from the ground up that had better optimization. In June 1995, Ace Combat was released in Japan and later released as Air Combat internationally. The game featured a paper-thin plot loosely inspired by the manga Area 88, where the player controls a mercenary force attempting to liberate a small island nation taken over by terrorists. Killing enemies would net the player money which could be used to purchase aircraft, or pay wingmen to fly alongside them. Ace Combat 2, released in 1997, improved on the first game's formula, introducing better AI, better terrain textures, and a more detailed plotline that gave us the first glimpse of the Yujian continent. For the most part, save for Ace Combat 3, which I'll cover in a video of its own, the following games stayed true to the format. Blow shit up, make money, and then blow shit up in a better plane. Ace Combat 4, 5, and 0 are heralded as classics on the PlayStation 2, but by 2007 with the release of Ace Combat 6, the formula was beginning to get stale. Ace Combat 6 had the unfortunate fate of being released solely on the Xbox 360 and only sold 436,000 copies. For reference, Ace Combat 04 released over 2.6 million copies. While the gameplay itself was excellent, critics found the plotline very much a rehash of previous games. TLDR, you play as a fighter ace helping to liberate your homeland, and through your actions, the course of the war changes. Namco, now merged with Bandai, set out to make the next ace combat game a bit different. Honestly, they had to. Releasing more of the same without significant changes would be suicide for the series. Using the Ace Combat 6 engine, Namco Bandai created a proof-of-concept gameplay trailer involving an F-22 Raptor engaging Sukhois over Grace Maria. The concept featured cinematic camera movements following missiles and gunfire. The F-22 could perform automated counter maneuvers via button presses. 
And finally, for the first time in an Ace Combat project, we got to see an actual damage model on the SU-33s. While crude by today's standards, Vulcan Fire could be seen violently disassembling the target until the point of breakup. It's pretty awesome, actually. Project Aces decided to move forward by making a full gamer on the concept. Writing the story would be American techno-thriller author Jim DeFelice. The game would be set in the real world versus Strange Real, a choice many fans would have issue with. Namco Bandai, however, saw an opportunity to model real-world environments like Moscow, Paris, and, uh, Florida. Gameplay would be enhanced from previous entries by adding a dogfight mode feature in which the player could activate a close-in combat minigame to destroy fighters. In addition to the fighter combat so beloved by the fandom, Horizon would include helicopter, bomber, and even an AC-130 gunship mission. Oh, well, what could go wrong? In October 2011, Ace Combat Assault Horizon released worldwide, and good lord, the fandom hated it. What the fuck happened? Hey! I'll cover this one real quick because everyone complains about it. Assault Horizon, like the rest of the series, prided itself on cutting-edge graphics. I'll be honest, even today it looks damned good. The textures are a bit dated now, but the explosion, steel carnage, and even the map environment still look fantastic a decade later. Unlike Ace Combat 6, Horizon really has dumbed the missile tracking physics down, and the gun acts like a super soaker in standard combat. Hell, you don't even get a tracking gun sight unless you delve into the core gimmick of the game. Dogfight mode! Okay, so this is going to be a lot to talk about. Dogfight mode, or DFM, was Project Ace's way to highlight the damage models present in all enemy aircraft. Instead of just locking onto a target and firing like previous titles, DFM locks your fighter in a close-up sort of mini-game in which you can attack with precision gun, missile, or special weapon attacks. The close-in assault sort of turns the game into a rail shooter. If the enemy banks hard, you'll sort of automatically follow them. You can break the DFM by pulling away or if another enemy gets on your tail, however. Calling back to the original Project Aces concept, enemy aircraft would try to use counter maneuvers to evade. The player could react with a sort of counter counter against them in a bullet time sequence, and it would be really, really satisfying to see the enemy get ripped up with a gunshot, but you've gotta be quick. In addition, the enemy fighter could use dogfight mode on the player, who themselves could pull some crazy Hollywood Colbert maneuver to evade. Target down. DFM was met with severe criticism as many enemy aircraft, labeled target leads, could only be killed using this gimmick in a long, drawn-out and scripted event. I mean, Christ, look at all the rounds I'm pumping into this dude. Just fucking die, please! One of the biggest criticisms of this game was the scripted events, most notably the final battle which really dragged and didn't offer the player much control in a flight action game. DFM also had a few moments where it would drag you into the ground if you weren't careful, a surefire way to ruin a perfect mission run. Interspersed in the campaign are stupid little quick time events, of which only two determine if you live or die. It's kind of a pointless addition in my opinion. Aside from the DFM debacle, you've got... Okay, so the two helicopter missions are pretty straightforward. You're down low in an Apache shooting armor or other aircraft and infantry. Crashing into objects is extremely forgiving as you just end up butting against a surface and bouncing off. You don't even take any damage. <laughs> Honestly, there's not much to write home about these missions. They're basically just three-dimensional first-person shooters. Instead of jumping over walls, you just fly over them. I do love how when you counter an incoming missile, though, the helicopter's fucking barrel roll. It's top-tier style points. There are two missions where you man a minigun on a Blackhawk as well, and it's really nothing too intricate, but it's a fun little time killer. Next. There's one bomber mission involving a low altitude interdiction mission. You can fly either the B-1 Lancer or the B-2 Spirit and stroke your enemies with a throbbing cock of freedom in the form of hundreds of dumb bombs raining down. It's honestly really awesome, it uses an air-to-ground version of DFM called Airstrike Mode. It's basically a corridor that lines up allowing you to inflict increased damage on a specific lineup of targets. It shows up in the main missions as well, and works a bit better than the DFM for the most part. Moving on. Okay, so hear me out on this one. Imagine you're a game developer in the late 2000s. Call of Duty 4 has just come out and was a shit-hot release. One famous mission set the stage for any military shooter coming out for the next five years. 
death from above. The infamous mission puts the player in the cockpit of an AC-130 gunship escorting ground forces. Now the AC-130 is a favorite of mine. It's a modified Hercules cargo plane with numerous guns mounted onto the port side to provide air support. It's the only aircraft I know packing a 25mm equalizer, a 40mm Bofors, and a 105mm cannon in a single package. Basically, you put it in a left-hand orbit over a target and rain death. Of course, every game dev needed to use such a masculine rain of death in their badass shooter. Modern Warfare 2, Modern Warfare 3, Hawks 2, Zombie Gunship, Toy Soldiers Cold War, and yes, Ace Combat Assault Horizon all needed to feature this badass platform. And, well, it's a black and white screen for 15 minutes while you shoot white highlighted targets on the ground. It doesn't even affect the plot any. That being said, let's talk about the main story for this game. Unlike other Ace Combat games, the protagonist wouldn't be a faceless mute pilot, but would be an American Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, William Bishop. In the far future year of 2015, the world is in turmoil. The game starts over Miami, Florida in a furball between American and Russian fighters. Our main character, a human slab of freedom, is the leader of Warwolf Squadron, a special Air Force contingent. Bishop's wingman is top-tier bro Jose Guts Gutierrez. After downing numerous Sukhoi 35s, Bishop is fired on by a shark mouth flanker and ejects. Helplessly dangling in his parachute, the shark rams him and... Of course, it's just a dream and he wakes up in his barracks. The real story picks up in, uh, Northern Africa, as NATO Task Force 108, made up of primarily American and French aircraft, attempt to put down an insurrection known as the SRN. With them is a Russian contingent led by General Staglashov, who prefers to do things his own way without any ulterior motives whatsoever. Oh yeah, th this game was made in that time period where the world was starting to get cool with Russia again after the Cold War. This is before the whole Crimean invasion of 2014, and of course, well, you know what's been happening in the rest of Ukraine since 2022. You do have an allied Russian squadron, Red Moon, who helps you in various battles over Africa, and its leader, Major Sergei Illich, does come off as a bro despite his commander's prick attitude. After Illich gets shot down and rescued, it comes to light that a number of advisors aiding the rebels are Russian-speaking. Claim which Staglish shot, I'm gonna call him General Stag from now on, dismisses immediately. This is after two nukes that aren't technically nukes call sign Trinity are detonated. I think there's actually a combat approved episode on the Trinity missile. Let's check it out! The EW-1 Trinity is the newest weapon in the Russian arsenal. Based on the venerable Kinzhal hypersonic missile, the Trinity can evade most international treaties while still inflicting the highest amount of damage possible. Trinity is said to be such a devastating weapon that the Russian military has painted them bright red to indicate their destructive nature. Trinity can single-handedly wipe out hundreds of enemy tanks in one blow. Nothing in NATO's inventory can come close. It may surprise the viewer that such a powerful weapon is in such a compact package. Trinity can be mounted to the Su-35 and, of course, the mighty Su-57. If you need to destroy a NATO-backed city block or refugee camp, look no further. After putting down other SRN actions, TF-108 is unsurprisingly blindsided by Stag, who betrays the NATO boys and runs off with his boyfriend, a mysterious Russian ace called Akula. Bishop's fighter gets shot up and he crash lands back at the NATO base only for a third Trinity war had to detonate a nearby town. The existence of other Trinity warheads sends TF-108 on a wild goose chase into Dubai, which turns up nothing aside from six Tu-95 bear bombers. If this weren't an ace combat game, those bombers alone would spark an invasion of Russia, just saying. Anyway. Around this time, an ultra-nationalist group in the Russian military launches a coup d'etat to, I think, restore the Soviet Union, 
It isn't really clear, but they call themselves the New Russian Federation. Basically, you end up with another Russian civil war where you have Russians that help you and Russians you shoot at. Oh look, the Black Sea fleet being attacked with A-10s. You know, I used to think this mission was the stupidest thing in the world, as attacking a modern naval fleet with low and slow flying warthogs looks suicidal on paper, but... Then the sinking of the Moskva happened in 2022, and... Now this mission just seems a little less dumb. But, uh, let's, uh, move on. TF-108 pushes into Eastern Europe, into Russian territory, and eventually puts down a missile field with a B-1 bomber strike. During the strike, Major Illish apparently suffers a mechanical issue and disappears on his return to base. Eh, pretty mysterious, I don't know. Soon after, the liberation of Moscow begins with TF-108 at the spearhead. Apache helicopters led by Captain Robinson beat back ground forces while Bishop and the War Wolves clear the skies. All's going well until... You got it, another Trinity. Right in the center of the city. With thousands of casualties being caused by the ultra-nationalist attack, Warwolf Squadron is able to down the other bombers preparing to nuke the city. After the last bomber is knocked out, Bishop comes face to face with Akula once again. A dogfight between the skyscrapers takes the player on a scripted but visually stimulating fight until... Akula gets taken down. General Stag, the head of the rebellion, offers to surrender. However, before he can, Akula, having ejected from his flanker, appears and offs the general. Bishop is then briefed on exactly who Akula is. He's Andrei Markov, an ace of the Russian Air Force. Having served in the Bosnian War as a mercenary, he sought revenge on the US after a bombing strike killed his wife, Krista. In a suicidal final attack on America, Markov readies an attack force consisting of himself, a flight of bombers, and countless fighters. First, they strike Miami. Bishop's wingman, Guts, gets hit defending him from a head-on attack by Markov in an SU-57, which strangely echoes his dream. His ejection seat disabled, Guts is ordered by Warwolf 1 to invert so his canopy can get shot off. And for what it's worth, it does work as stupid as it is. In another head-on pass, a coolest felon gets winged before he runs off like a coward to the north. As Bishop pursues Markov, he comes under attack from Illich. As it turns out, Illich is another traitor who was Akula's wingman in the 90s. I mean, fine. And of course, Illich gets his teeth kicked in and he crashes into a hurricane. Back on the pursuit, Bishop chases Akula all the way to Washington, D.C. It's actually a very impressive opening to the mission as you see dozens of aircraft on each side dogfighting. After killing the rest of Russia's entire flying Tu-160 fleet, Bishop spots Markov carrying Trinity on his wing. Another heavily choreographed dogfight mode segment envelops, and Bishop is able to finally shoot the fucker in the cockpit, ending his shenanigans once and for all. Markov. He's down. Wait a second. Trinity. Colonel, Trinity is still alive! Oh, fuck! Oh, my God! Nightmare's over. Finally. Colonel! Warwolf. Go ahead, Magic. What's your status? I'm fine, but need to land. Acknowledge. We'll alert National. And that's Assault Horizon. It's nothing special. In fact, one could argue it's a paper-thin story serving only to facilitate the gimmicky game mechanics. 
I can see how one might come to that conclusion too, but what if I told you there was more to Assault Horizon than meets the eye? We all know about the aforementioned criticisms of the game. How DFM is a gimmick, how the plot sucks, etc. But Assault Horizon did quite a few things that Ace Combat games have lacked since. For one, the majority of the campaign is co-op for up to three players. No other game in the series save for Joint Assault on the PSP has done that. Joint Assault, while a game special to me for personal reasons, is, well, severely flawed and mostly forgotten. The game also featured great multiplayer modes, including the standard deathmatch mode seen in Ace Combat 7, Capital Conquest, and Domination mode, which was sort of a base capturing mode. Each team would have to take ringed off areas on a map in a similar manner to the old school Star Wars Battlefront. In addition to selecting your aircraft, you have skill sets similar to aircraft sets later on in the series. These could increase your gun damage, missile accuracy, basically standard stuff you would see in Ace Combat 7, but in a system that applies to all aircraft instead of one. And you know what? Even with helicopters, Trinity missiles, and dogfight mode in the mix, it worked. It all came together in a cohesive manner, making for a fast-paced multiplayer experience that, in my opinion, the newest entry, Ace Combat 7, deeply lacks. Horizon also featured full aircraft paint customization. Again, a feature not explored since in a mainline game. It wouldn't be a Horizon match without seeing DLC Idolmaster skins fighting highlighter yellow F-15 Eagles and hot pink MiG-21s with machine gun pods. What it all comes down to is that it was just fun. Core features aside, the Steel Carnage, which spat metal and oil splatters from targeted aircraft, would end up being used as a feature in every main Ace Combat game since. Ace Combat Infinity and 7 both show off damage models pioneered in Ace Combat Assault Horizon with pride. Even 7 has a little you win cutscene every now and then on bosses where you see their shattered fighter blow up and fly off into the distance. A lot of the maps from Horizon would end up in Infinity as well. This would allow players to further experience them in a microtransaction filled nightmare of course, but don't worry, I have plans for Ace Combat Infinity. Now, I don't believe in defending movies or games by pointing out fixes or details in other media or what have you. What's in the game is what's in the game. That being said, I did find some interesting iceberg materials for Horizon that you guys might be interested in. According to an interview with Jim DeFelice, originally believed the plot would be set in Strange Reel, but Namco Bandai requested that it be set in our real world. I can only speculate what his original storyline might have been like if William Bishop were, say, an Ocean Ace? Jim also wrote a now-forgotten companion piece for the game, The Last Ace. The novel details Bishop's life before the events of Assault Horizon. The main setting of the story has him testing an advanced F-22 variant as he recalls the events of the Bosnia War in which he too was involved, like Markov. As a young pilot, he flew an F-16 with his commander, Colonel Skull Scranton. Throughout the story, Skull ends up downing five MiGs over Bosnia, only for his Viper to get hit while egressing. He tries to eject, only for the seat to not fire. Skull inverts his F-16 and orders Bishop to shoot his canopy off, which the young pilot successfully accomplishes. It's a feat Bishop would repeat later, saving his wingman guts in the events of the game. What's different about Skull, however, is that he does get saved by a rescue helicopter which ends up getting hit by a man pad, killing all aboard. Honestly, I think that backstory would have been awesome to have show up in Assault Horizon as Bishop's own flashback. I have to wonder if DeFelice ever considered such a plot point that ended up being cut. Jim, if you're watching this, I'd love to talk with you more about the story ideas you had back in the day. It's been over 10 years, so let's hear it. Now, I don't want you guys to think that William Bishop is some kind of deep character. No one is in this story but I did like seeing the player character having some meaningful, friendly dialogue with his wingmen. Assault Horizon is not a deep plot either, but it's honestly a bit of fresh air versus the previous game's failed attempts at writing emotional, anti-war plots and coming off as contrived and cringeworthy. I'm looking at you, Unsung War. Yes, I went there. If we're going to criticize the writing of Assault Horizon, we also have to look at the other end of the writing spectrum. I don't mind a good anti-war story. In fact, I'm a huge fan of writing such as All Quiet on the Western Front and Failsafe. 
I am going to go on record to say that Ace Combat 5's writing is just forced and bad because it glorifies the player's actions as they wipe out dozens of targets in a single mission, while at the same time giving this preachy war bad message. It comes off as disingenuous to me. In fact, the Unsung War isn't the only one in the series to do this. At least Assault Horizon is honest about what it's trying to do. It's a simple, modern warfare-esque action game that was a product of its time. With it came a multitude of innovations that shaped the later entries in the series. Love it or hate it, we wouldn't be where we are in the franchise if Horizon never happened. I mentioned at the beginning that this came out in my formative young adult years, and I'm gonna get a little personal here. I've been playing these games since I was in elementary school and they just sort of grew up with me. They evolved and grew from their humble origins just like I was. I started with Ace Combat 2, played the butchered Electrosphere, and my grandfather rented Shattered Skies and the Unsung War for me from the local blockbuster more times than I can count. Ace Combat Zero was the first game I bought with my own money at age 13. And then, 2011 is the year I graduated high school, the same year the game came out. Someone in their early adulthood is still figuring themselves out, and honestly, Assault Horizon was trying to figure out where the franchise would go itself. While the game was far from perfect, so was I. And honestly, I didn't like it all that much at first. I did grow to love it though as I went to college and played it online with people across the world for hours at a time. It came out in a time where I needed it, and that's really the best way I can describe it. I still can't call Ace Combat Assault Horizon a great game. Actually, it's questionable if it was ever good. Most people I talked to about it always had something to say, good or bad. But whenever they talked about it, they always had a slight smile on their faces. And that, perhaps, may be my answer. <laughs>